fellow brethren. Now, those of you who were here last week, you should remember that we talked about how the Apostle Peter pulled Jesus aside and rebuked him when Jesus was telling the disciples basically the mission, describing the mission of the Messiah to his disciples. And you know, Jesus explained to him that, that the path that I'm trailing, uh, rather the path that I'm walking, does not lead to the glory and honor that you expect. It leads to persecution. It leads to death, even death on the cross. And they couldn't, Peter couldn't believe that, right? Well, you know, I forgot to mention, and I, I, I mentioned it to Regina afterwards, I forgot to say to you that, you know, we look at Apostle Peter, and I kind of let laughed at it a little bit, you know, with the way he acts and the things that he does. But, you know, um, we really shouldn't be that critical of Apostle Peter, should we? We shouldn't be that critical, and we shouldn't, certainly should not be surprised by the things that he did. Because in reality, Peter doesn't really do anything that we do not do. I'd be willing to wager if I was a betting man. There have been times in each and every one of our lives when we have taken Jesus aside and tried to correct him, tried to explain to him, hey, this is the way we should do things. The way I, I feel is better than the way you're leading me. We all have done that at one time or another, spiritually speaking. And I thought for our communion uh, service today, what I would like to do is share a perfect example in my life being taking Jesus to the side and correcting him. And it had to do with communion. Now, I grew up in Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church, right? Took communion every first Sunday morning. Every first Sunday morning. And to be honest, I have to tell you, it meant absolutely nothing to me. I enjoyed the grape juice, because Mama didn't normally buy grape juice. She would buy orange juice. So I like the taste of grape juice, and that's the only time I got it. <laughs> so I like grape juice, but spiritually speaking, it meant absolutely nothing. But then I was a child, and I thought and acted as a child. Now coming into old WCG, I gained an understanding of what communion really meant. I understand, understood rather the, 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 what the symbols and the elements represented. But I have to admit, it, 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 at the same time, it was very ritualistic as opposed to what we used to do in Morning Star Missionary Baptist. You know, it was com uh, accompanied by virtual silence. Nobody said anything. Sad faces almost. Serious spending. It was also always preceded by the foot washing ceremony. And that is the understanding of how you take communion that was ingrained in my mind. It, was, it became so much a part of me that when we were first led to believe that we could partake of the elements of communion without first washing feet, that was like apostasy to me. What? <laughs> and not only that, to say that you could take it at times other than the Passover, <laughs> no way, I thought, I felt. The Spirit could not be behind this. Let me take Jesus to the side and explain to him how communion should be given. <laughs> that was my attitude. And, uh, you guys may have been a lot more righteous than me and didn't have to deal with that, but that was my understanding. Let me take Jesus to the side and explain to him how to keep communion. But you know, there's not much difference in what I did then, the way I felt then, and the way Peter felt 2,000 years ago. Not much difference. And I'll tell you also, there's absolutely no difference in the mercy, in the grace, and the love that God showed me then that he showed Peter 2,000 years ago. But God works with us patiently, brethren, lovingly, taking us by the hand, 
guiding us step by step, helping us to come to understand how he is leading us. We might be disagreeable about it at first, but he continued to be patient. As Steve was telling, he continues to pursue, right Steve? Gently teaching us. And thanks be to God, brethren, I can now stand here before you and tell you, hey, I look forward to, I enjoy taking communion. Taking communion. You know, Jesus said in Luke 22, uh, 15, uh, he said that, he told the disciples that night that I have eagerly, eagerly desired to eat this meal with you before my suffering. I have looked forward to that with great anticipation. And you know, tomorrow's the Super Bowl, right? And I'll tell you, I can't wait for the kickoff of that game. I have eagerly looked forward to it. But I didn't eagerly look forward to communion. One time a year was enough. It didn't make sense to take it more than once a year, right, Steve? I think some of y'all done walked in my shoes. It didn't make sense to take it more than once a year. One time a year was enough. But brethren, you know, I'll tell you, God is a loving God that we serve. A loving God, right? And he has led me. He has shown me, hey, John, when you take this communion, when you eat this bread, which represents my body that was beaten and was bruised, brutalized for you, when you drink the wine which represents my blood which was poured out for your sins. Right, Steve? For your sins. When you do this, you proclaim my death. You give a testimony to the world that you have faith in my sacrifice and that my sacrifice and my sacrifice alone Bring about your salvation. You testify to them. And I tell you, brother, I can stand before you today a changed man. I can stand before you today and tell you I look forward to taking communion. Because every time I eat of the, the bread, every time I drink the wine, I remember what my Lord did for me. I remember that he gave up heaven came down to this earth and walked this earth 33 years and died on the cross for me. I can remember the humiliation, brethren, that he felt, the, the, the shame of the mock trial, the crown of thorns. I can remember that. I can remember the soldiers uh, uh, gambling for his, his, his clothes, the clothes on his very clothes, the, oh, his only earthly possession, the clothes on his back. I can remember that. I can remember the nails in his hands and feet. I can remember the cross being lifted up, dropped in a hole. I can remember the soldiers laughing and grinning, piercing him in his side for us. Most of all, brother, most of all, I can remember his forgiving attitude. That while we laughed, while we joked, what did he do? He said, Father, forgive him. They do not know what they do. You know, brother, I'm reminded by Peter. Remember when Peter, um, when Jesus was washing feet, and he came to Peter, and Peter said, hey, yeah, you're not going to wash my feet. Right? Not you. And what did the Lord say? The Lord said, if I don't wash your feet, you, you have no, no part. And what did Peter said, he basically, hey, don't just wash my feet, Lord, wash me all over. Right? But brethren, I tell you, Peter's not much different from the rest of us. Come to communion one day a month, or rather, one time a year, should I say. Are you kidding me? I can have communion every day and look forward to it because I know what it represents. Let's pray. Blessed Father, we want to thank you so very, very much for your love, your mercy, goodness. I want to thank you so very, very much, O oh Lord, that in your plan of salvation, your plan involved 
you leaving heaven, coming down on this earth, dwelling with us, your creation, taking all of the abuse that we bestowed upon you, taking all of the persecution, taking all of the humiliation to save that very creation. We thank you so much, O oh great love, God, for the love you have for us. We thank you for the enlightenment that you've given each and every one of us here today, that we have been allowed to come into your presence, allowed to partake of your love, allowed to enjoy your grace. So we thank you for all of these things, Father. We thank you for the great love that you have for your creation. We thank you so very, very much, and we do so in our Savior's name. Brethren, if you haven't already, please eat and drink for Thanksgiving. Now Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 and verse 10, He said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Now here basically Jesus is talking about honesty and integrity in dealing with financial matters, right? Because God knows that our 
Integrity is most challenged, you might say. Or should I say it's often challenged. When we're dealing with finances. Uh, and he wants us to be honest in all things, right? Even the, the small, minute things that you can easily rationalize. Even though he's talking about honesty and integrity and dealing with financial matters here, you could say the same principle applies to generosity. Because like honesty and integrity, generosity is also a character trait, isn't it? It's also a spirit, isn't it? It's something that is in our hearts, something that stems from a desire in us to want to be like God, to want to imitate our God. Because like children, you know, children often um, want to imitate certain character traits that they see in their parents, right? Mm -hmm. Don't they? And it's no different with us. It's no different with us. As Christians, as the Spirit dwells within us, we want to imitate our God, right? And as we do, we see a God that is a, the epitome of generosity. We see a God that is limitless. We see a God who is a giver. And brethren, I'm here to tell you that following the lead of the Spirit also caused us to want to be giving as well. Doesn't it? It caused us to want to be generous as well. As best we can. Doesn't it? Now, Peter wrote, 1 Peter 14, 16. He says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as you were called as the one who, as, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy holy as I am holy. Same thing can be said by our God. Be generous as I am generous. Right? And I'm convinced, brethren, as we pray, like Mr. Johnson encouraged us to do, because the spirit that is in you is encouraging, encouraging you, giving you an urge, a desire to want to be like your father. Your father is generous. He wants you to be generous. Pray and ask him to help you to be more like him. And our generosity will grow. Amen? Amen.